All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to thank everyone for sticking around. Uh, this will be the last talk you see at KubeCon. So it's, uh, it's fantastic that you're here and you've chosen us. Uh, just a reminder, please grab your chairs on the way out. And last one to turn off the lights. We appreciate that. So they were going to talk to you about managing add-on operators with Go. My name is Jeff Johnson. I'm a software engineer at Google focused on GKE on-prem. Uh, my name is Justin Santa Barbara. I am a software engineer also at Google uh, on the GKE team, also very involved in SIG cluster lifecycle and, and COPS. So we've got a pretty typical uh, conference agenda here, and we're going to try to keep it demo heavy and keep things exciting. But before we do, we've got to talk a little bit about the background. So what is an add-on? Um, to, to think about add-ons and sort of how we've got to the point where we are, I think it's good to look at what are add-ons more chronologically. So if you look at a lot of the early add-ons, things like Cube Proxy, Cube DNS, um, these are very simple deployments, something that every cluster has. And it made a lot of sense to bake them directly into the Kubernetes release. So if you go to KK cluster add-ons, you'll see a bunch of YAML for these. Over time, as Kubernetes got more complex, as we grew a bigger ecosystem, uh, so did the add-ons. Now we have things like CNI, CSI, and, and ingress controllers. Those are, sure, adding cluster functionality, but they're very different. You, you're picking a different CNI depending on uh, your preference. You're picking a different ingress controller based on where you're putting your cluster. And with them, you also have a lot of different configuration for each one of those. And if we go a year or, or less, I mean, these things are getting quite a bit weirder. We now have things like Istio. Istio has a very complex add-on. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, there's a lot to orchestrate there. Now, with an add-on, we have this expectation that it is managed by the cluster. So when I update my version of Kubernetes, I get the latest version of kubedns that works with that cluster. That means our logic for deploying clusters has to understand configuration. Uh, it has to do the sort of CRUD operations that you'd have to do with any Kubernetes deployment. And it'd be really nice if it gave us a stance of health and availability. If I'm deploying a cluster uh, with kubedns, I'd like to know that that kubedns is healthy. If it's not healthy, my cluster is not really ready to be used. So let's talk about how it's done today. We're going to talk about cube up, uh, but this applies pretty well to Minikube as well. So today we package all these add-ons in the Kubernetes release. So if you look at these green boxes here, um, that's like in the Kubernetes tarball. On the startup of our, of our main machine, of our master VM, we're going to extract some of those YAML out of there, and we run them through this bash script. This bash script is a few thousand lines long, and it's extracting out which add-ons you want to deploy, it's applying some sed to them and sticking them in this special folder. That special folder is picked up by the cube add-on manager, and every you know, minute or so, it does cube control apply. So this is con the configuration, which I'm sure you can't read in the back. Um, but if you look at, zoom out and look at this whole file, it gets even harder. This configuration is something I would call append only. These are environment variables that over time, over new releases of new plugins, we're adding more and more to the core Kubernetes release. And it's, the problem with this sort of approach is that we really have no clue what's going to come out the other end until it does. So until we create a cluster, until it picks up all the environment values, until it decides which YAMLs it wants, this one has a switch based on some flag, uh, we don't know what's going to come out the other end. This is our cube add-on manager. Well, I will say it's some of the best bash I've ever written. Written, sorry, read, read in. <laughs> some of the best bash I've ever read. Uh, it is very hard to test. We really don't know until we have an integration test run that something failed, and there's really no way to know what failed until you dig into it. So I'll talk about just a few of the problems we've seen looking at Kubernetes uh, with these add-ons. One of the big ones that we care about uh, is that all our release versions are tied to KK releases. So if we want to roll a DNS update, we need to roll a Kubernetes release. We have that loop, that loop I mentioned, where kube control runs every minute or so. That is to prevent user modification. Uh, and to steal a line from Justin here, it runs every 60 seconds, which is 
just enough time for you to fix kubedns and tell your boss, uh, and then promptly be reverted when you go to show them you fixed it. <laughs> if we look at all the tools for COPS, for example, kubeadm, all of these are duplicating all these add-ons. Not only what they're deploying, but they're also duplicating how they get that into the cluster. So clearly the solution we have today really doesn't work for everyone. Clearly YAML is not enough. We have add-ons that need more. We are doing templating that is getting increasingly more complex. We really want to know about health and status, and we start to have scenarios where ordering becomes important. So I mentioned Knative on there. Knative won't work without Istio ready to go. It's pretty hard to express that in a uh, loop that just applies YAML every 60 seconds. The message and, and sort of why this is coming out of cluster lifecycle is that our cluster creation logic really ought to stop caring about these things. We really ought to simplify that and enable the people who are the teams, the, the folks who are really concerned with how those things deploy and how those things upgrade to own that experience. So why are we taking on this work now? A little plug. Uh, we're working on, I've been working on GKE on-prem, and it's a brand new project. It's a new project where we're concerned about uh, things running in customer data centers. We need increasingly uh, a larger amount of visibility into the configuration and the health and status of those clusters. But it's also a great time to just reevaluate what we've been doing for a while and start to set new standards. So we said it was demo heavy. Let's jump into that. I'll try to increase my font size. Is this legible back there? Okay. So I want to install Knative. How should I do that? Well, I could go to GitHub and find a bunch of YAML, um, but here's how I'd rather see it. Here I have a CRD, a CR, of an instance of a CRD. The type is Knative, and the only thing I'm really specifying here is this thing called channel stable. What I'm saying with this is I want the latest release of Knative, the latest stable release. Whoop, dash F of course. It's never happened before. All right, so my CRD was created. Um, let's take a look, at, a, look, a look at what it looks like in our cluster. So here I've got that instance. It's a normal Kubernetes API like I've come to be comfortable and familiar with. It's got that spec that I specified here where I said I want the latest stable, but now it has a status associated with it. And that status says that this deployment is not healthy, healthy false, and it gives me a human readable re reason why. It says that Istio system, Istio sidecar injector is not found. So we can take a look at that namespace. We see it's empty. Makes sense. Let's install Istio. With a little more demo time, this could also be a CRD. But we're just gonna install it. This is one I yanked off GitHub. It's not the smallest thing in the world. <laughs> of course, that's because it does a lot. <laughs> So we expect that to take some time to come up. We can see the Istio system is getting up there. That was fast. Let's take a look at that Knative's object again. So it's still unhealthy, but now we have a different set of errors. So now we're seeing that the Knative build component is not healthy. Now we're seeing these individual pieces. If, if you aren't familiar, uh, Knative has several components, a build, a serving, some monitoring, uh, several things involved. So if we can race, maybe we can see how that object is doing. Okay, so that, is our, that one has become healthy since we typed that. 
Let's go back to our root object and see how the deployment's going. So now we're just left with a single part of this that is unhealthy. Monitoring, it's a large component. It'll take a bit to come up. All right, it's made it. We can take a look at the whole cluster. We can see probably a lot has happened. Yeah, a lot has happened. Um, so great, day one operation is uh, flashy and it's great for a demo, but it's really something that you could just put on your GitHub and, and you could say, you've got to apply this URL. You know, we'll curl bash any script. I don't, I don't look at them. But uh, what about day two? In day two, we expect things to fail and we expect things, uh, new features to come along and want to upgrade. So as we saw in this Knatives object, I specified I wanted a stable release. But if you look a little closer at the builds, that was resolved to a version. So we're actually specifying we want version 02.1 uh, of the builds component. So let's say there's something in the alpha release I want. So it's a Kubernetes API. I interact with it like any API, changing that spec to alpha. Now we'll take a look at that builds component. That builds component has a new version. And I know for a fact that the serving component changed in this. So I expect to see some activity here. An update like this it was just a pod bump. So we just updated some pod specs. That's something that we'll let Kubernetes handle. We're just going to edit the deployment object and let it reconcile and roll out that update. But because we have a controller involved in this, because we're talking about operators, we have the ability to add more complex updates. So let's say that was a data migration. We now have the opportunity to usher that data migration and make that happen. Of course, we can delete it. Who knows why you'd want to? but it's important to clean up when you're done. And when we do that, we expect to see all the in other individual components go away. Builds is gone, there you go. So what we're here to talk to you about is exactly that, add-on operators. If Kubernetes add-ons are just normal workloads, let's use modern application lifecycle tools to manage them. In practice, this means a CRD for every add-on we have, an instance of that CRD, a CR, to activate it, and each add-on has its own controller to manage it. And we, I'll tell you that that is easier than it may sound. Let's walk through what happened in that demo. So let's say we have a kubeDNS CRD. That CRD is typed. It has a spec uh, and validation associated with it. I want to install that add-on and I can either specify potentially a version here or a source. And maybe there's configuration there. Not sure. I'm going to have this long running add ons controller. So that red box is the kubeDNS controller, and that database is our Kubernetes API. And me, the smiley face, I just applied that CR, and I got a kubeDNS CR in the center. Our controller is watching for that kubeDNS CR. When it sees that created, it's going to fetch the manifest. This could be from an HTTPS endpoint. It could be from another Kubernetes API object. Uh, or perhaps it's just a file on disk. It can then specialize that manifest and then deploy it to Kubernetes. So this deployment created a kubeDNS deployment, a service, and it also set up owner refs on that CR. As it's doing that, it's setting up watches for all these objects. And the important part about that, and the reason why we do that, is so we can have these health and st we can have status for the deployment. So we can watch for the successfulness uh, of those objects. We can watch each every one of those and create an aggregate health. My goal here is just to have a Boolean, is this thing working or not? So we can write tooling, or at least an operator can better understand how things are going in the cluster. And additionally, we can surface some human Human understandable errors, at least if you're a Kubernetes human. 
Kubernetes does its thing over time. It creates the pod associated with that deployment. And we see our status go to true. When our DNS starts crash looping, there's a number of reasons why things like this can happen. Maybe we have a bug, maybe we have a configuration problem. That controller is continuing to watch that. It's continuing to see alerts for that specific object. So we can then surface that things have gone awry. Things are not healthy. Additionally, you could imagine a scenario where that version of stable has updated. QBNS has pushed a security uh, fix. Well, the operator could very well pull that down and update your cluster with the latest version. So now we've talked a bit about uh, what we've been thinking about. Justin is going to tell you how we're going to make that easy. Yeah, we're going to try a possibly ill-advised mic swap first. So give us one minute, please, hopefully. On? Yes. That went better than I thought it would. That means the demo will now fail. So I, I think that was uh, an amazing demo by Jeff. I think that was really laid on. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I think that behavior is, is great. And I think we can all agree that we would like behavior of, of that level from our add-ons. I think the challenge is obviously, all right, how hard is it to actually create those, uh, those operators? Like, is this something that? Um, that is actually possible for, uh, for, for people that are writing components to actually do, or do you have to be a Kubernetes expert to do that? If, if we want to grow our community, we have to uh, ensure that it is, everything that we do is easy. And we have actually the beginnings of an SDK in Kubernetes to do that, which is called KubeBuilder. And what we've actually done is, is build a small layer on top of KubeBuilder. Uh, it's a, we call it a common set of extensions and an opinionated controller on top of this. And there are sort of two layers to that. Um, do you want to hold that? I think that might be. There's, uh, there's sort of a declarative layer, and then there's a, an additional add-on layer on top. And we're using this thing called Pattern. Um, so KubeBuilder is, is this framework that gives you, uh, or it's a, a program that immediately gives you a, a bare bones controller. And you see we've added the, this flag Pattern add-on to the KubeBuilder commands. And now when you pass Pattern add-on, you get a little bit less of a bare bone controller. And we will show you how you grow that into a full add-on operator from that. So here we go. Let's try this second demo, giving it demo heavy. All right. That's, I, this is a clean cluster, which I should have just cleaned up. And we are going to, I am not as good as, as typing as, at typing as Jeff is. So I'm going to use a auto typer. But rest assured, this is a real cluster. Um, the last couple of commands will be real, just to assure you. Um, so we are in uh, no problem detector. We are going to build an operator for no problem detector. No problem detector is a a component, it's a daemon set that runs on every node and looks for common uh, errors in syslog or other things that have gone wrong that indicate that your node might not be healthy. Um, so we, we're in building a Go controller, Go path. We've checked out node problem detector. Remember, the, the idea here is that really this is something that node problem detector can, can do themselves. Um, so they're going to create an operator in their, in their repo. They call kubebuilder in it. They remember to pass the magic pattern flag. They are going to create an API, uh, again, with a magic pattern flag. You can see they're, they're specifying a kind of no problem detector. Uh, we get an error, which just demonstrates that it's real. That's because I skipped dep for a reason that will become very clear in a second. <laughs> and, but we have, we have created a skeleton uh, um, API kind of kind no problem detector. And we'll, we'll instantiate that in a minute. Um, we want to manage no problem detector in a declarative way. Uh, everyone should be very comfortable with doing that by manifests. Um, and so we are going to build that manifest right now. Uh, we have this channels directory, which is where you define the channels that you know, define your stable uh, version and your alpha version. You could invent other ones, beta and gamma and whatever other versions you want. You can see here we have just one, uh, one channel which is stable, and stable currently the skeleton creates version 001. The current version of no problem detector is actually 050, so we will change 0001 to 050. <laughs> now you know why I didn't want to type this. 
um, we will, so it is now 0, 050. And now we actually have to go and uh, create that manifest or define what 0, 050 really represents. So there's 010, 001, <laughs> uh, we'll rename it. And we'll go in and we will have a look at the skeleton manifest and it is a empty manifest. We are the node, where I'm wearing my hat as a node problem detector developer so I know exactly where those manifests live and I'm going to copy them in here. There are actually two separate manifests so we'll just combine them into one YAML file. This is exactly why I didn't want to type this. There we go. And we now have a manifest YAML, which has our, uh, it's actually a, uh, a daemon set and a config map. It's fairly simple. We actually want to remove the namespace declaration. Uh, the add-on framework basically takes care of namespaces for us, so we don't need that. And let's, so that, was, that wasn't too bad, I hope. People agree with that. So are we ready? Basically, yes, we are. We have to run dep now. So now I have a couple of minutes to add lib while dep runs. Um, so the, I think the idea is we, we've already created our, our operator now, and I think it's important to realize that whether you create it in a separate repo or you create it in a subdirectory, like that was not hard, what we've achieved so far. So if, you, if you're currently defining an add-on via a manifest, it is not very hard to create an operator, and I would encourage everyone to go give it a go. If We have a couple of PRs out there that are hopefully going to merge soon, and then it, it will be that easy to create your operator. Um, one, need, one of the things we really strived for uh, when we were building this was to make sure that we also could evolve the functionality. So we're going to look at the code in a second. Oops, actually, faster than I thought. We're going to look at the code in a second, and you'll see that we've used uh, encapsulation and things like that rather than horrendous code generation. So even as the, the framework and our work evolves and we define as a, as a SIG and as a community new functionality that we think add-ons should have, you'll basically get that functionality for free by, by a recompile. Dep has finished. Good job, Dep. Uh, so make install will generate the CRD and we'll uh, kubectl apply it into our cluster. So you can see we now have a node problem detector CRD. There it is. Timestamp matches. Oh. Uh, Timestamp should match. I don't know what happened there. I apologize. I guess I didn't delete that CRD. That was fake. I apologize. All right. This bit's real. Look. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're going to go in here and we are going to run the, uh, the add on operator that we've just created. There we go. It, it's spinning up. It's going to look and there are no. That it, there, are no CR, there are no instances of our CRD yet, so it is now just going to pause. So let's go and create one. And we will now, we'll now run that operator again. The operator will now see that uh, CR instance and uh, take the manifest that we defined, uh, or look up the, the stable version, go find 050, take the manifest, and kubectl apply it. And there we are. It has the last right at the bottom there. You can see it ran a kubectl apply with two objects in it, which are our daemon set and config map. So if we have a look, we should see our daemon set. No problem detector. Created 13 seconds ago, so I did remember to that. Rem I, I did remember to delete that one before the demo, and our config map. And we should have three pods. There they are, running. 29 seconds. So. We just created our, our first add-on operator live in a couple of minutes. Okay, I wanted to, I wanted to just quickly talk about uh, some of the code uh, points. So uh, this is our use of uh, encapsulation rather than like generating lots and lots of code. So you see here, I think we talked about the idea of common spec fields and common status fields. Those common spec fields include, for example, the channel and the version. The common status includes the health information and the errors. Uh, and you can see we, we cleverly named them common spec and common status. And uh, the nice thing there is, of course, is that evolves. We can continue to, to enhance that behavior. Or sorry, add more. we can add more fields into common spec and common status, and you can just recompile and, and pick those up. And then the controller itself, uh, we basically uh, reconcile no problem detector struct is the struct that Cube Builder builds for you, and we've added this declarative reconciler uh, type, which we have en encapsulated, I guess, or embedded, and that basically defines most of the behavior, so we just call init, and you get basically standard behavior for a manifest 
driven reconciler. Uh, there, if you want to opt in to health and status checking, I think we currently require you to actively opt into that. So you had a couple more arguments to that in it uh, thing, but that's essentially how easy it is. It's all very, very much uh, automatic behavior. And this is, this is something we think everyone, every, pro, every project should be able to do this. So how can you help? And what do we still got to do? So what are the big things on the roadmap? Well, uh, one of the things we didn't talk about is, as I'm sure you know, particularly in OSS, uh, we've learned that every field and every manifest, for every field and every manifest, there's someone that wants to change it. Uh, you know, like certainly in my COPS experience and anyone that's ever worked with Helm knows that every field becomes a, a parameter. And we find that that is a difficult thing to do. We don't necessarily want to expose uh, everything in this, in this CRD. We want to keep it nice and simple with the core functionality. That's why I think Jeff was talking about it's not clear what is required and what we can punt off. And the, we have this magic tool now in the, in the open source community called Customize, which basically enables uh, everyone. It's a nice trade-off. You can, you can specify a patch, we can support those patches, and we don't necessarily have to map every single field. So it becomes maintainable to create these add-on operators. Uh, one of the things I didn't show is the RBAC generation. Um, the RBAC rules are a little bit tricky uh, for operators because when you, if you want to create an RBAC permission, you need to have, you need to bind, if you want to bind an RBAC permission, you need to have all the permissions that you are binding. Uh, and so the permissions sort of roll up and it becomes a little bit tedious. We, we definitely need to make that better. Um, one of the ways we might be able to do that is by bypassing uh, RBAC for, for these operators. It's not clear that we want to do that, but that's a discussion we're going to be having in, this, in the SIG and in the community. So your input there is very welcome. We have PRs open currently to upstream all of this code. Uh, there's a, a portion to kubebuilder, that, that pattern equals add-on flag. There's a portion into controller runtime, the implementation of, of the declarative reconciler, and the opinionated add-on logic on top of it. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we edited files locally there. Uh, they were in the channels directory. It would be great, uh, and the, the path of currently is that we, we bake them into the Docker image. We really don't want to have to build a new operator image every time you release a new version of the, the package you're, you're building or deploying. And so we, want, we need to get those manifest sorts through either HTTPS or for offline or air-gapped access to the Kubernetes API. Uh, there's uh, a Google project by Josh Hoke called the, the Bundle, which looks very promising, but another thing we're going to be discussing in, in the SIG, I hope. Uh, Jeff mentioned the, I emailed my boss and now it reverted. Uh, we, it would be better to have a webhook that, that actually intercepted any changes and prevented you from gaining that full sense of euphoria that you would actually solve the problem, that told you, you you haven't solved the problem, you should use Customize. Um, so working on that, uh, we actually need to then get this integrated into the tooling. Uh, OSS is obviously a, uh, a good one, in particular, the kube up script has been deprecated for, I think, a number of years now. And it would be great to finally get rid of the add-on manager out of kube up, or hopefully maybe we can get rid of kube up entirely. Um, but like integration into COPS, into kube ADM, into the cluster API, into Minikube, into all the, the projects that are out there. Um, and we, we've tagged this as help wanted. If this is something you want to get involved in, please, please do. And you'll be very welcome. Uh, SIG cluster lifecycles, we're going to be discussing it. Uh, and how do you get involved if you're not necessarily as familiar? Well, like, come talk to us in, in SIG Cluster Lifecycle. Um, and if you want to get started with, in a hands-on sort of way, uh, make your own operator. Uh, take a manifest from, from KK Cluster Add-ons and, and go through that same sort of process that, that I did uh, with the automated typing. Um, but it, it, it is that easy. Uh, and one of the ways we've really been working is sort of use case driven, or we haven't been trying to build a, an abstract framework in advance, we're trying to see what are the use cases that we see the various operators in the real world. What do they all need? What do they have in common? And when we find one of those patterns, we promote it into the add-on pattern. Uh, and we've covered our roadmap, so I think with that, we are, if there's any questions, uh, it would be great to take them. If you, we do have a mic up here, so if you do have any, ah, if you have any questions, do you want to run or? Uh, yeah, we're. Uh, for the for the uh, for the camera, the question was, uh, how how does this compare to the operator SDK? Um, do you want to take it? Or? So uh, a lot of this that we're building is all in the controller runtime. 
Um, so we think that this is in the whole sort of operator ecosystem to take advantage of. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for sharing there when, since we're sort of based off a lot of the same tooling now. So figuring out what is the use case uh, for each of them is something we should do sort of out in the community, I think. And this, and this is something we're, like, we're doing this as a open source PRs and we've already, you know, although it is Googlers on both sides of the PR, they are giving us excellent pushback. And like, they are the ones that motivated the split between sort of the declarative and add-on uh, uh, layers, which I think has actually been very helpful for the code so far. And Super. please do comment and contribute more in, to that discussion and see where, the, see where it can better help the operator SDK as well. Yep. Oh, oh. So that, that uh, add-on um, operator... I'll repeat the question. Yeah, good call. So the question was, uh, can we explain what the pattern equals add-on flag is doing uh, when we pass that? Uh, because this basically sounds like any other operator. So uh, Cube Builder today is, is fantastic at creating APIs and creating frameworks for you to build controllers. Um, the, the pattern add-on gives you a bit more opinionated controller to get started with. Um, so it allows you to get a much faster path and gives you some of the features that we think core cluster add-ons ought to all share. Um, I do agree that there's a lot of uh, overlap, and that's why we started and have received the feedback to put a lot of these into this declarative sort of package instead of just add-ons. So separating what is purely an add-on concept and what is just a normal workload concept. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in the future for that to extend uh, the controller experience. Um, but like Justin said, we're very use case driven, so we want to focus on this very specific need and see what we can share, you know, long term. So an example of what is different, um, when you just do create API, you get a function that says reconcile, and in that function you get the name of your CR object, and that's it. So when you, pass, when you specify add-on, you're going to get um, this templated code that will implement reconcile for you uh, in this way that works based off of a manifest. And, and that, that declarative work, uh, you can use that separately from the add-on pattern. So if you have some other operator that you can best define how you reconcile by means of a kubectl apply from a manifest or something, or some, some other means of sourcing objects, you should absolutely consider uh, using that layer. My suspicion is that's why they had to split it out. I think there was an item on their, on their roadmap anyway. Lucas, and then we'll come here. Oh, sorry, you were first. So the question was, uh, how, does the <clears throat> how does bootstrapping work here? Uh, like, do we have a, an operator, operator type concept? Uh, I think the, pardon? We, yes, we, we have to keep the add-on manager bash script after all. Sorry, cube up, it's, you're stuck in the, in the tree, thank you. <laughs> um, the, the, I think the rule that we propose is that uh, the operators themselves must be kubectl appliable. And there will be some, in other words, should not themselves require complex logic of any sort. And that, and that there will be some piece that will be sort of part of your tool that is able to do that, is able to install that root uh, bootstrap turtle, as it were. So what response to the add-on CRD? Um, so that is the, what Justin started to run there, uh, he built that, built the node problem detector operator. That is what ultimately responds to it. No, no, but that, that's the CRD for the node problem detector, but I'm talking about the other one where it was like add-on.sig, whatever add-on, right? That, that add-on.sig is just a namespace. So as part of working on this, uh, we, we, we started thinking about, well, do we just want an add-on type? Do we want a pure add-on CRD you know, type add-on name kubedns, type add-on name, you know, native. Um, and instead of, we, we thought about going that route, but it feels like um, 
the, the risk is sort of ending up with all these configuration, configuration options that are unrelated. So each add-on has its own unique CRD. And there isn't like a tie back to a central add-on CRD. They have common fields, so we can manage them and think about them in the same way and sort of write tools that understand those fields. But we want to really have the authors of those add-ons own their API um, and sort of own their story with them. Is that, 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 Does that help? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did we you, I, I didn't understand the question. Do you want to try rephrasing the? Do you want to rephrase the question for for me, please? The the instance of so what in, what uh, software installs the instance of the CRD? Yes. So the, there are, we have to install both actually an instance of the add-on CRD, and we have to install the CRD itself, and we have to install typically a deployment or a stateful set for the operator. Those three things, we, we sort of by rule of, we, we rule that they must be uh, easy to install, that they must be kubectl appliable. We say that you, you shouldn't build an operator that requires complex orchestration. So when, once we've said that, we, we punt the problem to your, to your installation tool, right? So we think, worst case, yes, you, you have a bash script that goes and like applies that manifest. But if you have some more advanced tooling, you can use that. There's a, Alex, is there? I think Istio's a good example, right? Instead of 150 things getting installed, you apply three, and it's easy to make those three. Easier, at least, and then it's on Istio, and it's on the Yes, I think so. For people who didn't hear, Alex was saying it's it's uh, also about uh, delegation of responsibility, and it's much easier to install those three components. It's much easier for the SIG cluster lifecycle or the add-on tooling to install those three easily managed components than it is with, in the current situation, where effectively the the tooling is responsible for managing the 150 odd objects that make up an Istio cluster. So we, Lucas, I think you were next, and then up the front. <laughs> Yes, I mean, we, you want to speak to So what, uh, so the question was, how do we test Kubernetes upgrades? What is updating the operator and when? Um, I think there are aspects of that that are open questions. Um, but what I think we've done is make it a lot easier to, um, to perform those upgrades. And we've also made it happen a lot less often. So we do expect you to once in a while need to bump the cube DNS operator, but we don't expect you to have to bump it very often really just when the semantics of kubedns change. So we always will have some sort of orchestration tool that is bumping the API server, that's bumping the kubelets, and we'll probably do that at the same time as the operators. So we expect to be able to cube cuddle apply all this stuff. So we expect to have sort of an opaque blob of really simple, a really simple deployment that our cluster tooling can say, well, our upgrade story is uh, the kubedns team has supplied us with a new version of their operator, so we just apply it, and that's it. Probably it should be kubeadm though, Lucas. <laughs> is, that, is that? Yeah, and also, like, after an upgrade, when we've done that, how do we ensure that the operator knows or whatever that is upgraded, that it can go back afterwards? How do we ensure that it's? If, it's if, the new, if we have a new Kubernetes version 113 and it doesn't come up cleanly as the Adonis upgrade of so I'd say one, th so how do we ensure that we can sort of do rollbacks and that the operator knows to do the rollback? So in that, in the thing we expect the cluster tooling to apply, we expect it to apply the deployment of the operator, but for those really core add-ons like kubeDNS, we would expect it to also apply an instance of the CR. So that CR will carry with it the version that we expect it to be at. Um, and that version may be stable, and that stable very well may resolve to say, okay, I see that my Kubernetes is at version 1.11. I'll ask the, uh, you know, the, the Debian apt, uh, you know, equivalent of the Kubernetes uh, manifest service or whatever it is to give me that version. I think that'll probably be encoded in, in different tooling and we're looking, I think, at bundles to solve some of that in terms of what's compatible with what. Um, but I think there's a lot of open questions there as well. A lot of great stuff to explore. 
Uh, yeah, I think Jeff is spot on. I think also one of the nice things is because we've used Go code, we don't have to invent some language to get started. We don't have to define a DSL to sort of start the ball rolling. And sort of that's how we've been developing this so far. Like we've been uh, encouraging teams to build their operators and seeing what problems arise and what use cases we can identify in, in common across them. And I hope we can do that in, in the SIG. So the, the question was, are we really doing away with the add-on manager, please, right? To, can I to paraphrase? Yeah. Yes, we are. We, the, we, we very much intend to replace the add-on manager bash script. Um, the, uh, yes, there aren't that many tools left that use it, to be honest. Um, but yes, the, this is the, the intention is to replace the, the, both that particular script but also to produce something that meets the needs, that is sufficiently advanced to meet the needs of everyone, all the tooling that's out there, so we don't have the situation we have today where tool one uses this approach and tool two uses another approach. So no more Etsy add-ons? <laughs> no more Etsy, the question was no more Etsy add-ons Kubernetes. I think, I think yes, we, that is definitely a, Etsy add-ons Kubernetes is a particular problem, is it an Etsy add-on? Anyway, it's a particular problem for HA clusters. So yes, we definitely, like we saw the, um, the idea of pulling from HTTPS uh, or from something inside the cluster instead. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's another good motivating reason because essentially a file on a local disk is not very amenable to multi-master operation. Yeah. Uh oh, Mason. Uh, how do you handle secrets and configs? How do we handle secrets and configs is the question. That's a great question. Um, I've seen, so internally, we have teams working on this uh, and, and have been using this for a while. Um, and we've, we've tried a couple things out um, and it's not clear exactly what's best. And I, I think it depends on what you're deploying. An example I've seen um, was a situation where we wanted a password. Um, and we had a lot of approaches where we could stick the password in a secret ahead of time. Um, but what we ended up doing is an approach where the operator, when it runs its reconciliation, checks to see if there is a password, a uh, password secret that it has access to. If it's there, uh, it will use that and do its deployment with that secret. If it's not there, it'll generate it and save it in that secret um, so it's accessible to the user. There's a lot of questions there about how do you rotate that thing. Um, but I think by sticking to Kubernetes constructs for defining those, we're sort of able to solve that, you know, everyone can solve that in the same way. But I mean, yeah, I think, Maybe the reason why this is hard is because different applications have slightly different semantics on like how often do I rotate my secret? Can I rotate my secret? How often should I rotate my secret? And is my secret a random string or is it actually a, like a certificate pair? Yeah, and, and I think that again by using Go code we are able to not restrict you in any way. It's, it, maybe that feels a little bit like you know go do it yourself, but the nice thing is like when we see the patterns, I hope we can pull them out and make it so that if you're the first one, you'll have to do it yourself. So you'll probably have to do it yourself. But uh, when you're the, the person behind Mason, then hopefully we can just uh, like say, point to that pattern and say, this is a simple text password that never changes. Go use Mason's pattern for that. And one of the back, I don't know if we can. So the, the question was, how do we draw the line between what should we manage as an add-on and what should we manage separately? Um, we, we, that is an excellent, excellent question. Uh, we, we try to define things which we think are clearly, uh, we, things which are clearly add-ons, and they are things that are managed as part of the cluster lifecycle. So things that are tightly bound to the Kubernetes version. Um, I think there are, there are going to be people who think that more things are part of their, their cluster. And so, for example, when we did the uh, Istio and native um, example, there will be people who think of Istio and native as add-on, as, as things that they add to their cluster. And there will be people that say, well, I really want native. I don't really, I'm not thinking about Kubernetes. And so it's also like different people have different views. And I think one of the things we, we are aiming to make easier is to make it so that you, I think there will be, there will be a, an opinionated set that your tooling will probably do, but it should be very easy to turn add-ons on and off. So we'll likely install, we hope tooling will install the, the add-ons for a larger superset, even if they don't necessarily turn them on. I don't know if that 
Make sense? Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. Are there any other? Oh. The question was, we added the pattern equals add-on flag to kubebuilder. Are there any plans for other uh, patterns uh, besides add-on? Um, yeah. Yeah, we are the first, but I don't know. Maybe, the, but I, I would be surprised if we were the last. I mean, and, and also I think uh, we, we, got that feed builder from, we got that feedback from the kubebuilder team that they actually were seeing people that wanted to build more, more patterns. And one of, their, one of the reasons this hasn't all merged yet is because kubebuilder is trying to go stable and patterns are probably going to be on a different life or a different stability path. They're not, they're not going to be stable right away. And so the idea is basically to have the ability to have these clearly defined sections of functionality. And there are other people that are also reaching out to the kubebuilder team that want to do that. And so if, when we figure out the repo where it should live, then yes, if you want to build a pattern, then I, I, I think they would be very receptive to that. So the question was, uh, Knative needs or depends on Istio. Uh, when they are both uh, add-on operators, uh, should, operator, the, is, should the native operator call or invoke the Istio operator? And I think it's, is that a fair? Yeah. It's, it's another one of the TBD. Um, we, we certainly can, we could have had the native, I think there are a couple of patterns. We could have had the native, when, so had Jeff's demo when he created the native CRD actually created uh, instances of native build, native serving, and native metric monitoring. And it could easily have created an, an instance of the Istio uh, CR, which I think is what's on my cluster anyway, um, even if it's not Jeff's. And the challenge is whether, whether that also implies an ownership relationship. Uh, so that's the first one, and it probably does, so that would be a little weird. And the other thing is sort of how are you enabling it? So in other words, how much value is there in automatically turning it on, and we sort of, my guess, and this is where we need your input, is that if you're going to be installing it anyway by kubectl applying it or running a script or copying something, one command versus two commands is not a huge deal versus the sort of cleaner separation. But that could well be very wrong, and if you have opinions, I, I very much welcome them. It could be a it could be, yes, it's a good idea. So the suggestion was, could it be a parameter? Could we say that the, we have a mode or, a, yeah, a mo like manage Istio versus uh, external Istio? Yes, I think it absolutely could. I think that's a good idea, and we should look at that. Yeah, I think, so Mason, I think, was saying that what if the Istio uh, CR already exists and out of band management, and yes. And I think, I think it goes to the native use case. Like, am I, am I a user that is wanting to use native, or am I a user that's wanting to install native on my Kubernetes cluster? And so that's why I like the idea of the parameter and that it enables you to say I am persona A or persona B. So that might be a great answer. But I think we can, we can I hope we can figure this out together in SIG cluster. Life cycle. I think we are out of time. Yeah, we are well over time. So thank you guys so much for sticking around asking all these questions. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Hope you had a great CubeCon.